Okay, Kitsuksima Tsimokboa. Welcome to part one of two for my lecture on the lunar cycle saw aki, some the duck moon. In most years, this is the sixth of seven winter lunar cycles. In the odd years, the leap years, when there's a somatsiki, some or deceptive moon in the winter, then Sa'aki some becomes the last lunar cycle of the season, which it is during the year when I'm making this recording, which is not 2012, <laughs> by the way, despite what this slide indicates. That just shows you how long I've been, uh, partly how long I've been giving this particular lecture. Saaki Sum is a very important lunar cycle for the peoples of the Northern Hemisphere all around the world because this is the time when we reach the equinox and after the equinox, life really begins to erupt. And the winter starvation, the winter famine comes to its end. If you have been participating in my Blackfoot Phenology course from the earlier part of winter, which is what I recommend that people jump in. I recommend they jump in at the first winter lunar cycle, but really any time in the beginning of winter is good. You should have by now developed an eye for changes in some of the minutia at your site. You should know most of the players who were there all winter, but more than that, you should be um, catching, noticing things as they shift. And during Sa'aki, some things are gonna shift very rapidly. In fact, if you were at your site every day, you would find that something changes every single day now. There are new birds. There are a lot of animals who are mating. There are new arrivals from those who migrate in for the summer. It's an exciting time and it's going to get very intense. Sa'aki sum is manageable if you've been following along through the winter and visiting your site as recommended in the course, um, soon we're going to get into a time when it becomes very difficult to manage even for the experienced, even for someone like myself who's been engaged for more than a decade in this learning. The man you see in this image here, Bull Plume, Stomach Sea Sopop, was certainly engaged in the same manner. He was an Iochkimi. He was paying attention. He tried to convey what I call real time to the church. And he did so in the manner that you see at the bottom of this slide the lines that are drawn here, the little calendar representation, is his kind of attempt to represent the Blackfoot stick count um, so that the church could understand it. So all those little crosses, the four little crosses you see there are Sundays. The crescents are the first and last crescent of the lunar cycle. The circle in the middle is the full moon. The four lines that are attached at the beginning are the time when the moon has disappeared. This is how Bull Plume represented the lunar cycles. And if you want to see his original document, how he was trying to communicate with the church through this, if you go to the Glenbow archives online, look in their finding aids and search out, I think it's called Pagan Agency. You can look at his original ledger book where he 
wrote um, several years, many years actually, in the Blackfoot lunar lunar style, and uh, he would write a, a summer and then a winter and then a summer and then a winter, and he would have a a drawing that went with each that represented some kind of a story that uh, took place or, or concluded during that season so that there was a story to tell. That becomes his winter count. So he's, he's, he's very famous as kind of one of the last beaver men to keep a winter count and, to, and certainly is the only beaver man who's, aside from myself, tried to express the beats in the way of of the people who belong to the water to the mainstream. So I, I like to I like to honor him in this moon because this moon to me is very special. Very special. Uh, this is this is a, a lunar cycle that has really taught me more than anything about what it is to be a beaver man. Out of your sights the water should be opening up. The ice should be melting, if not already gone completely. At Shpopikimi, where I study a lot of the time, it's an area of the coolies that's often in, it's in shadow through most of the day. So the ice melts a little slowly here and some of the things that occur happen at a rate that's a little bit slower than other areas of the coulee uh, around Sikokotok, where I live. Along the river, at the beginning of the lunar cycle, everything's open. There's no snow left. And um, life is going to begin to interrupt. And for me, one of the pivots of that new eruption of life is the Opspiniks, the Canada geese. And I can't have enough gratitude for the Canada geese for teaching me, uh, shaping me to become part of the person who I am today. And to um, my late elder, Mikskimi Sokatsim, Alan Pard, who, when Mahoney and I were transferred the beaver bundle, decided in our first year to challenge us with a task, and that task was to bring waterfowl eggs back into the public ceremony. At some point, chicken eggs had replaced waterfowl eggs of, as one of the four foods that were served, four foods that in the songs are said to give long life, and that is buffalo tongue, berry soup, pemmican, and the waterfowl eggs. And so, Mik Skimi Sokatsim told us when we opened our bundle at the end of our first winter, publicly had our ceremony, that he wanted us to only feed those four foods. And he said, you know, you're going to have to go buy your bison to get your tongues, to get your meat for your pemmican, because there's no bison on the prairies anymore. But when it comes to berries and waterfowl eggs, the source is still there. And berries wasn't a problem. Both Mahoney and I grew up collecting berries, but waterfowl eggs was something neither of us had ever engaged in. And I started asking around because Mikskimi Sogatsum himself never participated in gathering eggs and didn't really know how to do it and was basically putting the task, putting the onus on us to bring this part of the ceremony back. Um, beaver bundles have been in a state of um, what would you call it renewal since the late 1980s picked up in the mid 1990s and so aspects of the ceremony continue to be brought back in and revitalized and revived. Some of that 
depends on going back to the source like he directed us to do. Because the thing about Blackfoot knowledge is it all comes from the environment. Hey, it all comes from these animals. So people worry about losing things from the oral tradition. And it's a it's a valid worry. It's a valid concern because I've been to a lot of native communities where they've lost pretty much everything. Their languages, their ceremonies. They're just native by gen genetic code. <laughs> but even in that circumstances, the traditional knowledge is still there in the place. You just have to return to the source, to the ones who taught it to you. And in this case, it meant returning to the geese. So Mahoney and I, we asked around, we asked elders, how do we go about gathering these eggs? And nobody had direct experience doing this. Some of them re remember their parents doing it. And, and with that, I kind of roughly estimate that the practice has been gone for 50 years or so. So within five decades, you know, you can lose something that's pretty key as you'll, as you'll come to maybe appreciate. Um, so we, we couldn't rely on anything that the elders told us because they'd never done it themselves. About the best advice that we got was an elder who told us to watch the waterfowl on the water. And when we see the males alone, then we can suspect that the females are sitting on nests. And then if we walk around the perimeter of the body of water, we will find those nests. This is good advice and bad advice. <laughs> Yes, certainly the males uh, alone on the water might indicate that the females are sitting on nests. But if you walk the perimeter of that water, you're not going to find the nests. Each species of waterfowl has a different strategy. And none of them just nest on the edge of the, edge of the water at the shoreline. Um, the Canada geese, who were the first to lay eggs in the season, the opsminiks, the ones with the white jaws, build their nests on islands. They do so, um, obviously, to, to keep predators at bay, especially the, the land-born predators. As you'll see in this lecture, they also have airborne predators who they can't hide from so easily. But if they're going to use islands in this manner, they have to put their nests in very early in the season before we get our floods. So this is what happens almost as soon as the water, as soon as the ice has thawed and we move into Sa'aki some, then the geese are near to laying their eggs. And in the first year that Mahoney and I were challenged to collect waterfowl eggs, we thought, well, after we asked the elders and realized that nobody really knew how to do this, we thought, well, it must be during Sa'aki, some. it must be during the duck moon that we go out and find those eggs. So we did, we went out, we looked around, and we found a a female um, goose sitting on a nest on an island, this one in particular. You can still there's, see there's even a little bit of ice and snow in the background. It's very early, as soon as the water thaws. But there's another timing device that I'll, I'll tell you about. In any case, I waded out to her and walked out on the island. She got off and allowed me to um, access the eggs. She didn't put up any fight at all. And there were six or seven eggs there, and I took two of them. I left an offering for her. And we went back home, Mahoney and I, and cracked open those eggs and very quickly realized that if a bird is sitting on a nest incubating, 
by modern standards at least, it's too late to be gathering those eggs. You know, you, you go from when it's laid, well, I shouldn't say when it's laid, when they start their incubation. They don't start their incubation just as soon as the eggs are laid. They lay their eggs until they get a full clutch, and then they start their incubation. That way, they are, all the eggs are timed to, to hatch on the same day, and they don't have to sit around for a week trying to keep young ones near them. Um, if, if they're all born the same day, then they can go, all get up and start moving right away uh, as, a, as a family. So they'll wait, they'll lay their eggs at a rate about one a day till they have their clutch that they're happy with, till their eggs are done, they don't have any more growing in their body, and then they'll incubate. Once that incubate, incubation begins, it, it develops quickly from a single cell to a full gosling in 28 days, which is a, your basic lunar cycle. So when we opened up our first eggs, we found something that by our contemporary standards would be too gross to eat. Uh, little developing goslings, you know, not observably goslings yet, but there's a lot of veins and blood and stuff going on in those eggs. And um, not like the eggs that you buy from the supermarket. So we knew we can't feed these at our ceremony and that we'd fail. So the following year, we decided to begin observing the, the birds uh, one lunar cycle earlier during Pitaki. Some. And if you've been in this course through the winter, you'll know that when you watch the birds during Pitaki, some the geese start off that lunar cycle in their big clans still, in their big family clans, then split off into the smaller families, the parents and the young from the previous year, and then pair up and the parents leave their young. Um, some of those young may find mates right away. Some may have to wait another year. But in any case, you see a pairing up and you see the birds acting defensive. And as you roll into Sa'aki some, you should see this behavior. Mating. The mating of the, of the geese. And after the mating, things are changed. And the females begin to act like this. Keeping low. Trying to hide themselves from others. Um, trying to stay concealed while the, while the males, the ganders, if they're good husbands at least, which many of them are, fight off any intruders into their, into their kind of zone where they're planning to make their nests. And then at some point you'll see their behavior change, right? And you'll just know, know that they've probably got eggs hidden. And eventually you'll see them on the nests. Now, of course, you want to go in when they're hiding their eggs. Okay? And this is the timing that I want to tell you about. Hallmark didn't make it up. <laughs> the Easter celebration. The collection of eggs at this time of year. You know, there's a reason why the even in the Catholic Church, they didn't mess with this holiday too much. You know, of course it was an old pagan holiday, the celebration of the eggs. You go and you find the eggs, Easter egg hunt. And what time does Easter come? Easter is not on a regular day every year like Christmas, December 25th, or Halloween, October 31st. Easter comes at a different day every year. And that is based on the equinox and the full moon. So once you have the equinox, the very next full moon, that's when they're laying their eggs. 
And then, of course, the Catholic Church says Easter is the Sunday after the full moon, after the equinox. <laughs> and they throw the Jesus story in there, which has nothing to do with the realities of our world, which are about these birds, their eggs, and the end of the winter uh, famine. So, um, so, yeah, the timing is at Easter. And the full moon itself is the white rabbit. And again, Hallmark didn't make up the white rabbit. <laughs> That's why you see the white rabbit in Alice in Wonderland, too. And he's got a clock. And he's, and he's late. He's late. He's running around. That's the moon. Because even in Europe, they used to have lunar time. They used to go by lunar time. As well as solar time. But there's a balance. Hey? you got to have both. Gregorian time, modern time, is only solar time. And so people stop paying attention to the moon. And when you stop paying attention to the moon, you miss a lot of the magic. So yeah, the full moon, they'll start hiding eggs. And then about a week later, toward the end of Sa'aki, some, they'll be on their nests. They'll be incubating. So you have all different kinds of nests, right? You have... This is a nest that the goose herself made. She gathered um, bulrushes, piled them up, and made herself an island. Right? They like islands, as I said. Beat the, beat the flood, go early, nest on an island. That at least keeps away the coyotes and other things. Because geese are conspicuous. They stick out. There's no mammal hunter that's going to pass by and not notice a goose if it's like on the shoreline with a nest. It's ridiculous. So they use islands. They make their islands sometimes. Other times, they find islands that are already there or peninsulas that are like islands. Anything that's surrounded at least on three sides by water, even that is elevated islandish. Sometimes they will nest communally on islands. You know, if an island is small, the geese compete for it. If it's larger, they may nest communally, and you might have a situation where some of the mother geese will actually lay eggs into the nests of other mothers to be incubated. So that rather than your typical clutch of maybe seven to nine eggs, you might have clutches on a communal island of between 20 and 30 eggs. That's more than one goose's eggs. That's three or four goose's eggs, at least. And, uh, and one goose will be incubating. As far as I know, I haven't really sat out there to see whether the mothers of these communal nests take turns. That would be interesting. But, um, but they, I know they, at least that they do communally nest like that. Um, This is on the, the uh, a river island. It's an old bike and some willow and stuff. Just any kind of cover, any kind of concealment and, and uh, strange thing might work well on the island to draw the goose's attention. And you can see up by the front tire of this bike, I mean, inside of the front tire, actually, there is a, um, there is a nest with the one egg so far. Um, they'll be they'll be putting more in there. Sometimes you have bridges, and the bridges have anchors in the water. And those anchors in the water, the geese will perceive as nests. This is a pair of probably first year geese, first first time nesting, maybe maybe not even first year, but at least first time nesting in there. You can see that the the female goose did not have a good time laying the eggs. It, you know she's bleeding. And one of the eggs itself cracked because they're being laid on the concrete. You know, as human beings, if we are really going to practice atsimskats, and one of the things that we might think about is how can we make these anchors that we put into the river that are perceived as islands to the waterfowl, how can we make them... Um, appropriate so that the waterfowl can actually use them successfully. I mean, they do, uh, but then you have incidences like this too, where 
you know, it's just sitting on bare concrete and, um, and, and broken by the time it's even laid in, in a lot of instances. Sometimes there won't be any islands available, but a goose will then choose a high spot. It might be up on top of a bale of hay, might be up, up on top of an old tree stump. In this case, a goose decided to use a hawk's nest. And I followed this nest, Mahoney and I did, uh, the year that, that she was using it. And um, we knew when she started incubating, we timed it. And when we got to 27 days, just a day before the hatching, we had a huge storm, wind and rain, and it knocked the nest down. And only one, one gosling survived. And that was a gosling that we ended up calling Miracle. And Miracle ended up being adopted into another goose family. I believe I, I tell that story, share that story in, in the lecture for the next lunar cycle, so I won't do it here. Um, in any case, just know that it's not impossible for geese to use other things than islands if they don't have islands available. Um, they'll use something that isolates them from the land mammals, which are their greatest threat. So what does it look like when a goose is hiding her eggs before she's incubating them? Well, it looks like this. This is a uh, this is on a river island in the middle of a little bit of willows on that island. And you have a place that you see almost center frame here where there's, there's some leaves and stuff gathered together. It looks very natural, but once you have an eye for it, you can tell that this is not natural that this is a goose uh, who has pulled some of this leaves and twigs and stuff together to create a kind of a mat over top of a hidden egg cache. And when you dig inside there, you will find the eggs. Um, if, an, if you come upon something that looks like this, it's already being incubated. This is not an egg cache. This is an incubating nest. And the, the, the difference is, of course, not just the exposure, because even an incubating goose, when she's going to go eat, she'll cover up her eggs. Um, the difference really is the, the number of, of belly down feathers that you, you see here. The nest is really lined with those belly down feathers to help keep things warm and keep them the consistent right temperature and everything. Goose doesn't pull out those feathers until she's going to incubate. You know, so until then, it'll be like this. Now you can see some little plumes and stuff in here. Those are actually from past year's nests. This is not stuff that, that a goose has pulled out this year. Those are old, old feathers. But yeah, once it's like this, don't even, you know, bother taking them. Unless you want to eat something that's potentially bloody and not of our contemporary standard. Some geese, like you'll have a, a range of behavior. Um, many of the geese when I approach their nests, will allow me to access them. But uh, it depends on the family. This is one of the geese who really trained me and Mahoney. Um, we followed her nest for the first three or four years as Yachtimix. And we kind of saw her as the matriarch of the pond, you know, after a while. Um, we knew at the very least that uh, she was willing to sit her nest through all kinds of conditions, usually while they're nesting. Because we're still in the lunar cycles of winter, we will get the odd snowfalls. So she has to sit there through the snowfalls. And sometimes geese will 
will abandon their nests in, in some severe blizzards, but not this one. Uh, she'll stick it out. If she's got a good husband, he'll stick it out with her. And this is an image going into nightfall, and you can see a goose here on a small little island. That's a gander standing guard. His wife has unfortunately positioned her nest on top of the um, flotilla of beaver food <laughs> at the lodge. Um, going back to this image here with the open water at the first part of the month, first part of the lunar cycle anyway, uh, you can see that flotilla is away from the, from the beaver lodge. Um, during the winter, that would have been right next to the beaver lodge because that's where they had their food pile. But over the winter, they ate out what was underneath the ice. And so when the ice thaws, this just becomes like a raft of material, whatever was above the water. And geese will perceive this as an island and sometimes lay their nests on it or position their nests on it. And then inevitably it floats away and disintegrates. So that's not a good strategy, but that's what happens. But what I'm trying to point out here is the gander who will stay up, stay alert, guard over his wife. Geese really have the best husbands or some of the best husbands, at least in the natural world. Um, our goose that uh, my wife and I really fell in love with, the one that trained us the most, this one here, right now she's standing over her egg cache, and she is very much willing to lay her life down uh, for the eggs. She's not going to let me go in and take eggs from her. And you're going to run into geese like this, okay? Uh, who are who are not willing to to give up the eggs? Others are are quite approachable, and we have a traditional technique that we use when we go gather eggs, where I bring along a rattle, one of our rattles, and the rattle freaks them out and and gets them to back up or at least not attack while you're gathering eggs. This is her husband, and her husband is uh, quite the guy. <laughs> he, he would get in so many fights every year, um, and he stuck by her. He was one of the ganders that was there by her side the whole time. She's incubating. Every day he's calling the shots, telling her when it's time to go eat, when it's time to go back to the nest. Um, and beating up any, anybody else that comes close. He's a tough gander, and he'd lay down his life easily for those eggs as well. This is him in the foreground and her standing. She's, she's standing right over her egg cache. He's guarding her from us. You have to have this kind of bravery if you're going to succeed in nesting in the goose world, because not only are there the land-born predators, including coyotes, weasels, badgers, skunks, but you also have airborne predators, like the ring bill gulls, gai. Gai is the Blackfoot generic term for all gulls. The first ones to return here to Kitao every as we come toward the end of winter are always the ringbill gulls. And the ringbill gulls come here and they're hungry. Um, and their first food is the same as ours, basically. You know, you might find them by the river eating some clams, but they're waiting for eggs. And they ravish the, the goose nests. You know, the chances of a goose carrying through from laying the eggs to incubating them to bringing them to full term is very slim. I would say less than 10% of the nests succeed. And a good portion of those are raided by the ringbill gulls. 
They'll also be raided by pelicans. You can see here a goose sitting her nest, her gander, getting ready to fight a much larger pelican, American white pelican. The pelicans in Blackfoot, by the way, their Blackfoot name is Ai Sipisa. Um, this is one of their names, actually. There's several names in Blackfoot for American white pelicans, but Ai Sipisa kind of refers to the way that their uh, their mouth seems logged down with water. It seems to be holding water. <laughs> they look like pterodactyls, but um, yeah, we we have these here in Alberta um, and here in Lethbridge at my site, and they'll occasionally eat, eat eggs as well. It's not their main diet. They're mostly fishers, and they fish communally. They fish as a group. They they're communal hunters. But yeah, they'll go after eggs. Perhaps also Mohgummi, the great blue heron. He shows up this time of year, just returns. Same with him. All of these hunters, they're not here before the eggs are here. Well, Gai, they'll come just, just a week before or so, before the eggs. Then you get the pelicans. Then you get the herons. And the herons are another potential nest predator. Again, like the pelicans, they're mostly fishers, but, you know, if a mother goose happens to leave her nest and go eat for five minutes and the heron's there at the nest or in that area, might take advantage. Some of the other birds that are here still, this is our winter waterfowl, Gistipimisa X, the common golden eyes. Um, they'll still be here in this lunar cycle. Should also see Misa X, the common mergansers along the river, another fish eater. They stay here year round. Miksikatsiks, the mallards return. You may have had a small group of mallards overwintering, but they return by the thousands during this moon. And they'll already start um, pairing up and defending territories themselves, much like the Opspiniks did during Pitaki, some of the eagle moon. You'll see that whole process go through again with the mallards. The American widgeons are one of the first waterfowl to return in that, in that sequence. Um, mallards first, then widgeons. Sasksimoko uhtuki sa'e. Sasksimoko uhtuki sa'e means the green ear duck. And you can see why. <laughs> Could have just as been well called the white mohawk duck. This is a name that is new in the Blackfoot language. The real name, the old name for the American Witchens was lost, but I had a, a grad student that worked with me to develop, a, a, to work with the elders and develop some new names. So this is one of the new names, as is this one. Apoiskinisa'e <laughs> means the brown-headed duck, northern pintail. Start to see these guys on the prairie potholes. They like the shallow ones. Shallow, brackish waters. The waters that the oil fields like to say aren't useful. Um, because they're brackish, we just use the brackish waters. Well, they're using the waters that belong to the northern pintails and others, like the shoveler duck, apakui sa'a, the wide mouth duck, also likes the shallows. 
So all of these, as you as you go into this lunar cycle, you start seeing all of these birds returning, hey? New faces. You've been seeing the same faces for several lunar cycles through winter. You start wondering how much there might be to learn. We're just really beginning at this point. <laughs> Things are going to become overwhelming. Don't worry. So yeah, northern shovelers. Another dabbling duck. Likes the shallows. And the lesser scalps. Sikoto kanisa. Uh, the black-headed duck. They'll return as well. It's a dabbling duck. So yeah, each of these, you'll see this kind of sequence move through. Only the mallards and the teals will come close to nesting during this lunar cycle. These others, these later arrivals, won't, won't get there quite yet. Hooded mergansers, whom we don't even have a Blackfoot name for anymore. This is one that we're going to have to develop a new name for. A uh, fish eater comes in. Fish and other aquatic animals. And one of my favorites, Axixixix, the American Coots. As you'll see as we move into the, the summer lunar cycles, the Coots are quite the characters. They are really odd. Some people call them mud hens. They're like a chicken. They got chicken-like feet. They don't have webbing. They don't even have a duck-looking bill. They're very chickeny, but they live in the water. They love the water. So the coots should arrive. Keep your eye out for them. And I'm not going to uh, go too far into their behavior because I'm going to cover it in the next couple lunar cycles. As we really start seeing them head toward their nesting, they do some very interesting um, preliminaries. To their nesting and the ways that they nest are, are different than a lot of the other birds as well. For the most part all these species are able to get along so if a goose approaches a, a, another goose's nest he's in trouble but if a coot does it's usually not a big deal it's not always the case but for the most part. Up on the foothills, more toward the mountains, you'll also see the return of the sandhill crane, sea gum. Sea gum. And the sea gum, um, and actually, you know, sea gum itself really is a name that belongs to the whooping crane. Um, a lot of people refer to the sandhill crane as meek sea gum, like the red crane. In any case, uh, the cranes are represented in, in Blackfoot stories, particularly in the Scarface story. The man who goes to find the Lodge of the Sun to have his scar removed so that the woman who he adores will, um, will be with him. She herself is committed to the sun, and so sends Bawakski to ask permission and as proof he has to come back without his scar and he only gains the favor of the sun in order to do this by protecting the morning star from seven cranes sea gummocks who are attacking him who are, who are threatening to kill him and those sea gummocks are whooping cranes, they're white. And Scarface is able to, uh, when, they, when they come to attack, he's able to kill them all and scalp them, and, which is why they end up having red tops on their heads uh, still today. But they represent the winter moons, eh? They represent the winter moons. And whenever you see that number seven come up, in the Blackfoot system, yeah, it may also have a connection to the sun, the moon, and the five visible planets. 
but um, far more than that in the Blackfoot system, at least seven is Kitsika, the frozen feet, literally, is the winter. See Cummings. So I'll stop there, part one, and then we'll pick up with, um, we'll explore some of the plant and insect life um, and some of the smaller bird, the, the passerine life, when we go into part two of the lecture.